to building applications on the Cisco Open SDN controller. So very much focused on, on development, um, focused on two things, the internal Java APIs and the external REST APIs. I don't know if any of you guys went to the REST session. I think it was yesterday there was a, a session on, on REST APIs. Um, one thing, I guess, to get, get a feel is, are there any Java programmers in the room? One, OK, well, I'll cover the Java APIs then. Um, I thought I might have got off the hook on that. Uh, what about Python, JavaScript, that kind of stuff? OK, a few more. So, so I'll cover both of those areas. But as I say, specifically looking at the Cisco Open SDN controller, I really wanted to cover Yang models and what Yang models are, because my own observation, so to give you a bit of background on myself, um, like a lot of people in Cisco, I guess, my background is in building IP networks back from the ISP boom of the mid-90s. Before that, though, I was a C programmer. So when, um, when the whole SDN thing started to happen, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I can maybe get back to a bit of programming. And so going away from what I had been doing, which was all MPLS, Layer 2 VPN, SP Backbones, et cetera, and going to looking at SDN. Um, and what I found in, in getting into Open Daylight, which is what the Cisco Open SDN controller is based on, is that really you need to understand Yang models to get very far with it. So I was going to try and give you guys a bit of a taster of how you navigate a Yang model and perhaps some of the tools that we use for looking at Yang models. Um, and then looking at Java apps and how we develop Java apps. And I have an example of an app we developed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, ResConf apps. So I have an example of a Python ResConf app which I wrote this morning. Um, so I guess we'll see if it works or not, because it's not been very tested. Um, and then Q&A. But actually, if, I mean, any time you want to ask a question, just like stick your hand up and yell. Um, they probably have a roving mic. And this size, I'm sure I can hear you all. So Cisco controller, what is it? So it's, it's a commercial distribution of open daylight. So it's based on the Helium release of open daylight, which uh, uses Carafe packaging. Uh, for its Java OSGI container. But in fact, we package the Cisco controller as a virtual machine. So you get an OVA file, and you can just run that OVA file under VMware or VirtualBox, et cetera. And what we've done is to pre-install, pre-package the things that we have been using most, I guess, in dealing with service providers, uh, particularly in the wide area where we have BGP and PCEP and NetConf Yang. And the stuff I'll be showing today involves that. Also OpenFlow, which you know, to many people is synonymous with SDN. But in fact, I guess our view on, on Open Daylight is it's so much more than just OpenFlow. And really, perhaps the way to think of Open Daylight and to think of the Cisco controller is less thinking of it as an SDN controller and more thinking of it as a development environment. It's a development environment with a shed load of southbound plugins for talking to different types of network elements. And it has built-in clustering support for replicating your data. So it then becomes quite easy to write your apps on top of that and get benefit of those different southbounds, benefit of clustering. So we've, we have a UI that we put in the Cisco controller. But of course, in reality, once you're in a carrier network, you don't tend to see the UI so much. They're nice to look at. And we have, um, I think, eight or nine demos on the Dev Innovate stand over there, all with nice user interfaces. But in, in reality, you'll probably be writing code that just talks the device over REST interface. Um, and I mentioned clustering, so we've effectively pre-packaged it so you can run either a single node or a three node cluster. And it is now shipping as an early field trial. So if you want to get your hands on it, I mean, actually, Kaushik, who's down in the world of solutions, she's one of the product managers, so she can help with that. And as I mentioned, come and see us on the Dev Innovate pod, which is the third pod over there. So this is the structure of the Open, S uh, the open Daylight Controller in the Helium release. And I guess the, the only reason I'm showing this really is to show the, the level of Cisco contribution. So large chunks of this have been written by Cisco and our partners. So a lot of the base functionality, but also a lot of the different southbounds. And I'll be showing those southbounds today. And the key thing, as I mentioned before, is you can really add value wherever you want. So you can either write code to add to the controller, or you can write apps that sit on top of the controller. So what we've done is we've We've left out certain parts of, of open daylight because they're not really where we're focused. And part of the history here is that in the beginning, open daylight had what we call the AD SAL, which is the application-driven SAL. And everything's moving to this new model-defined SAL, which I'll come on to. And SAL is the service abstraction layer. So we've really focused on the MD SAL applications. So we've left some of the older ones out. 
We've taken the MD cell work. And then we've added a bunch of new stuff. So I mentioned you know, user interfaces, et cetera. But because we, we package as an OVA file, within that virtual machine, we packaged a lot of stuff around logging and metrics, et cetera. Really just to make it easier to operate it. But equally, you know, it, may, it may well be that larger service providers will still just take the, the raw open daylight source. They'll build it for themselves. They'll add their own apps in. But this is very much pre-packaged and ready to go. But also, of course, we're supporting it. So you can get support through the community. But equally, we'll have pay-as-you-go support options. We'll have a validation testing scheme so that you can get a Cisco-compatible logo for your application. And then we also have a scheme to resolve issues where you know, the classic problem you'll start to get when you have your apps and a controller and then network devices from multiple vendors, because this is an open platform and it'll support multiple vendors' equipment. You know, how do we arbitrate disputes that, that come up? So just to show you the, the community support, I'll quickly flick into a browser. And this is where I realize I'm still running Jabber. Not very clever. Oh, good, good. Um, Sorry, this is while I play with the technology. Right, so the um, so we have the um, if you go to developer.cisco.com site OpenSDN. This is for the Cisco OpenSDN controller, and the community support will be through here. So there are community forums that you can go into, ask questions, get answers, that sort of thing. But of course, within the, the base Open Daylight, that's very much a community-supported open source project too. So you can join the various Open Daylight mailing lists and, and get support that way. But let's have a quick look at Yang. So you know, what is Yang? Well, it's a data modeling language. And it was defined in, in RFC 6020. So any of you who like the sort of ITF world and like reading RFCs, you can go and read that one. It's, it's pretty long and complex. Uh, and I have to say, I, I find myself referring to it every day when I hit, when I hit problems. Um, and it was designed to model NetConf data. So NetConf is a protocol for configuring routers through an API. So instead of going at the CLI, as you'll all be used to with a Cisco router, logging on to the router and making changes. You go in through an application programming interface. And effectively, there's a protocol for carrying that data. And the key there really is that um, I don't know if, if any of you have worked in, in operation environments, service providers. But what we would always end up doing is writing a ton of expect scripts. And the problem is the scripts are pretending to be a human. So why should we have a computer that pretends to be a human as it does stuff? and is then vulnerable to any slight changes that we make in the CLI, why wouldn't we have an application interface so that the computer knows it's a computer and is sending messages rather than emulating a human? Um, the sharp eyed amongst you may notice that this RFC is newer than this one. Um, it's actually a second revision of NetConf, that one, but it, it did originally predate Yang. And what really happened was the service providers really said to the ITF that they wanted this kind of model, this approach. So a modeling, data modeling protocol, and then a, um, a protocol for configuring routers that allowed them to do a lot of transactional stuff. So you can do commits and rollbacks. With NetConf, you can actually do that across multiple devices, which is pretty neat. So for example, if you're configuring a tunnel from one device to another, if something needs to be configured both ends, so a pseudo wire, for example, if one end goes wrong, but the other end worked, well, you can roll back the one that worked. So that's a, a really useful capability. Um, but what we found, actually, in open daylight, we've used Yang for this model-driven SAL. So although it's defined specifically for configuring routers, effectively the whole of open daylight is models using Yang models. And we've effectively used Yang models as our IDL. So any interfaces, for example, between a southbound plugin and the controller itself, that will be modeled through a Yang model. And then APIs for that get generated on the fly. And I'll come on to the APIs. And the, and the reason we generate them on the fly, so at runtime, so code is generated at runtime to do this. And the reason for that, I guess, particularly is that in the NetConf case, what will happen is your, your NetConf client, which in this case is the op Open Daylight plugin, will connect to a device that supports NetConf. And it will say to that device, well, what capabilities do you have? And what models do you support? And the device will send back this whole list of models. So any of those models that the controller doesn't know about, it will then get the device to send it the actual data for that model. And at that point, it will generate the APIs on the fly. So you can then see, when we come to the REST examples, very simply how connecting to a Cisco router that supports this 
you can then immediately see those APIs. So I wanted to cover those two API cases, the Java APIs and the REST ones. So in the Java case, these APIs are created from the Yang models at runtime. And so the Yang model gets mapped to Java classes. And effectively, you have classes for each sort of part of the data structure of the model. So if there are containers, which are like structures in C, there'll be a class for each of those. If you have a list of items, there'll be a class for that. Type def, so we're defining new types. Again, classes get created for that. But the key thing here is we've designed this for performance. And the way in which we've done that is, I guess, twofold. Firstly, the DTO, so the data transfer objects, the actual instances of that data, they're all immutable. So it's write once, read many times. You don't need to keep checking that things are the same as they were before, because you're guaranteed that that's the case. And then the APIs are asynchronous. So you don't have the classic thing where you have to create a thread, so that thread can sit there waiting for something to happen and get back to you. It's asynchronous. The events will come in, and you can handle them. And if you need to scale, you can create a pool of threads to handle things that come in. And so very much performance focused. And so I guess what we say generally is if, if you're developing an app that's going to be very close to the network and needs very high performance, then the Java approach is probably the way to go. However, there is probably more overhead in terms of understanding it and learning it, which is where the REST APIs are simpler and easier to use. And I'll come on to those. And the way we, we do applications is we package them as these craft files. And you just literally put them in a directory within the controller, and automatically they get loaded. So I have an example of that. So in this example, it's um, an application that we wrote, in fact, a couple of weeks ago and came down to, I think, about one, one week, so sort of five days of somebody's time, six days maybe. Um, what it does is it enables the service provider to create LSPs through their network from an API and to do that using CLI on Cisco routers. So the first question was, how did we get at CLI? So um, on, I think, the second stand over there, there are the NCS folks. So they have a platform that enables you through something they call a NED to map from a Yang model onto CLI. And because they expose a NetConf interface, we can access those Yang models from our NetConf clients. But the first thing we do before we do any of that has got to be how do we know what routers are out there? You know, we're going to create LSPs. We have to know what routers there we can create them on. And so what we did was we wrote some code to auto-populate the inventory in NCS. So when you start NCS, it doesn't know about any routers. It's empty. How does it find out about them? Well, what we do is we have a component in Open Daylight, which is the BGP Southbound plugin, and BGPLS in this case, where it's getting data effectively from your, from your OSPF or your ISIS, your interior routing protocol. That data is being exported over BGP. But of course, BGP, it's kind of hard to decode. You know, lots of TLVs in it. What we actually do through, through this is we bring that up into the controller. We create a rib in the controller that you can access through the REST APIs or internally through Java. And then from that, in fact, what we then create is a link state topology. And the topology really is just a list of links and nodes and connectors between them. So I could show you quickly the rib. Of course, the font here is probably horrendously small, and you may not be able to see it. But so basically, what, what you have is a set of routes. And the thing is, of course, as I say, there are no TLVs or anything, so it's easier to understand. But you still, you still have to understand what a route means. You know, these are just BGP routes. And that's where the link state topology helps, because and we bring that up. Actually, maybe we can zoom in. There you go. OK, so you may now be able to see some of this. And so we have topology, and it's literally just a list of links and a list of nodes. And we have these TPs, which are effectively the connectors between links and nodes. So it's then pretty easy to write code on top of that. And I'll show you an example of that later on using the REST APIs. And so come back to this. We, so we wrote this component that goes into this topology. It finds all of the routers in that topology. And then each of those routers is effectively added into the inventory here in NCS. 
so having got the routers in the inventory, the next thing is, well, how do we create, how do we create paths between routers? So we wrote another component, this config app, which exposes an API which is very simplistic in terms of, I want a label switch path from this router to that router. Perhaps it has this amount of bandwidth, and we have an explicit route or not. Maybe different explicit routes with different preferences. This app then translates that into commands, which then will go through the Yang model that TLF exposes, then into the CLI, and it will literally create tunnel interfaces, and it will create explicit paths. So probably easiest is to show that and how it works. Are we back in Chrome? Yeah. So literally add a tunnel. So you can see, whether you can see this now, we literally have a bunch of parameters. This, this is shown here in XML. I think I'd ask for the output in JSON, so we may see that. But the, um, I'll come on to this. One of the really nice things with RESTConf is you can choose XML or JSON for your, for your data. I think generally what we find is people use JSON if they're coding from JavaScript or Python, just because it's so much easier to use. Um, and I'm literally specifying, I've got an input node, a destination, I'm giving it a name, I'm giving it a couple of different paths, one's dynamic, one's explicit, and then literally send that to the network. And what you find is a delay here while it literally goes in and configures the resources and commits the information. So while it's coming up, I'll log back into the router. In fact, here you can see, yep, that succeeded. And I'll zoom in again. Uh, oh, yeah. Oops. Oh, there it is. So this is the interface that's been created. I've been running this for a while today, because I think I started at, I started at Tunnel 7000. I'm up to 7095, so I've run this a few times. Uh, and you can see it's created these paths, one explicit, one dynamic, the same as we had in the API. But the explicit path, of course, in the CLI is created through a separate operation. So we can look at that explicit path now. Oops. And there you can see the explicit path that it's created with the indices. And through that same API, we can then delete tunnels. We can modify them. So for example, I think that tunnel initially, I think initially we had, what bandwidth did we have? So we had 10,000 as the bandwidth. And you can, for example, change that and say, I want 25,000. come back here. Yeah. And so you can see you know, the bandwidth's been changed. I could equally have added a new path, taken a path out, delete the whole tunnel. And what that looks like internally is, is kind of a, a pretty big stack of Java code. So you, you end up with so this whole application. And I guess this is where the, the Java approach is perhaps, as I mentioned, more complex. You have to really underst understand the way in which we code it. So you can see these, um, the immutable DTOs, yep, sorry. They're all, uh, zoom in, zoom in. I should have realized this wouldn't work. Uh, da -da 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 -da. How do I zoom in on this one? It's probably still Apple Plus, isn't it? No. Anyone who knows how to zoom in gets extra marks. Zoom in, zoom in. That's going to be interesting. Ah. What is Apple Plus? OK. So you can see, again, the um, large use of finals for all the immutable types. And really, the, the key thing here is that this code that you write imports a lot of this code. So you can see these, this code with gen in it. This is all stuff that's been generated at runtime. And so you, ac you access those classes. And so you have to know from the Yang model what that class is going to end up looking like. 
So let's look at the easier approach. And we'll look at REST. So it's just the same in that the, the APIs get generated at runtime. But now effectively what you have is a structure of URLs that maps to the Yang models that you have. And in terms of operations, a simple HTTP GET can be used to read data. But if you want to make a like write to config, then you can do it with puts or posts, or you can delete config. RPCs you run with posts. So in that, that example I showed earlier of creating the tunnel, it was a post to a URL. As I mentioned, I think most people prefer using JSON. And certainly, everything I've coded, I've coded in JSON. The issue, as I mentioned, about performance and where we've optimized the Java APIs for performance, you will get lower performance here. A lot of it's just practical. I mean, you, you've got to serialize all your data into text that's flowing across the interface, whether as JSON or as XML. And then also, of course, you've got context switches going on, because you have one application which is in one process, and it's calling this API, which is running in a different process. So if you're really close to the network, probably not the right approach. But for a lot of utility stuff, this is great. And um, the app I wrote today uses that. And I'll show that in a sec. So the, um, I can probably show some examples of these URLs. And really, just this is where I mentioned earlier about Yang models and the need to kind of understand them and follow through them. And I can, I can show some examples there. You have to know the models in order to follow through and know what your APIs are going to be. And that's probably the thing that as people get up to speed on this on, on coding with Open Daylight or the Cisco Open SDN controller, I think that's kind of the bit that perhaps is the biggest learning curve, is learning how to go through Yang models and, and understand what's there. And I guess that's in contrast to some of the other platforms where we've kind of predefined, you know, here are all of our REST APIs and documented them. In this case, the controller is going to learn new APIs on the fly. So you've got to understand how it is you follow through them. So let's look at some of those, in fact. So here's an example of something I'm getting over the REST API. And this is actually the interface configuration on a router. In fact, it's that same one I was looking at. So if I do a refresh on this, I'm guessing we'll see that tunnel. Or am I on the wrong router? I may well be on the wrong one. Ah. I'm on a different one. But the, um, as I say, you can get XML or JSON. The interesting thing here is, yeah, in, in the URLs, you literally have to figure out what the name is of the Yang model you're accessing. So in this case, we have a model for the interface configuration. And then you look for the top level containers in that model. And that gives you the initial, the initial API. And then you can follow down through that. So if I show the API, or the Yang model, so I have that here. So here you can see in that, in that specific model, I found this top level container of interface configurations. And that is what I'm referring to in this API. So that's the name of the model and then the interface configurations. So the next step is well, I want to go to another level down. Well, you can see we actually have this list called interface configuration. And each entry in that list is the configuration of one interface. So then, well, how do I get at those? Well, the, the question is, it's a list. I want to pick an entry out of a list. The first thing I need is a key to figure out which entry I'm grabbing. So what you'll find if you look in the model is it will actually define for that list, this is what the key is. And the key is given in terms of fields in that list that are going to be the key. And we have a very common design pattern here where we'll have a container with a plural name. And then the list will have a singular name. And the reason for the singular name there is really that when an individual item, it looks more sensible to say you know, interface configuration slash the interface. But as you see, the, the key is actually whether the interface is active and also its name. So let's grab, let's grab one. So it's fun doing this one. That was one I made earlier, yes. So then the list name. It's active, and this is the loop back I'm going to get. I should probably make this one bigger as well. Oh, yeah, it's plus as well. And you can actually then continue going down through all of these, through the data structure, until you hit something that's sort of unstructured, that's just an, an endpoint, a leaf in the tree. 
So the IPv4 network is the next one. So let's. So there's the network. And that network, again, you can have multiple addresses on an interface. So, oops. And so on, and you just keep going down. Oops. But now, this will be as far as we can go, because, yeah. Uh huh. Yep. There is, in fact, yes. Yeah. So the question is, can you see those APIs? In fact, there is a um, a Yang model explorer. So somebody saw this issue and said, "Okay, we need to create something to let you go through the models." I think I have this. I think I have that running here. We'll soon find out. Um, I mean, I see the benefit of having the Yang model and being able to auto-generate the APIs, but just as a developer, yeah, I want to see the API rather than go through and try to parse the, the Yang model in my head. Yeah. Yeah, so it is much easier to, to, to see it there. So that is the wrong one. Ah, see, I haven't built it. I thought I had and I hadn't. Um, I can show you that offline. Um, and basically, you can go in and you can drill down into the APIs and see what's there. I guess I've tended to just do it by grabbing the files themselves. I think once you get to a point that you understand the models, it's kind of easy to grab the file and look through them. Um, some of the Yang tooling that's out there, so it's worth looking around for it. There's um, an app called Piang, which basically lets you see, the, amongst other things, it lets you see the structure of a model. So you can do a Piang minus F tree, and it will show you the sort of tree structure, the hierarchy of what's the top level and the next level, and so on. And so. You def yeah, you definitely need that in terms of getting into writing the code. Chris, you. Hey, I was just going to point out that we developed a uh, plugin to Deluxe on Open oh, Daylight yeah, yeah. called the Yang UI. So it will take the uh, Yang models dynamically and then render a UI. And there's also little clicking things that you can do to look at the um, contents of the uh, REST API. And you can also execute or call the RESTConf API that's auto-generated from that Yang model. And we, we're demoing it over there. And it's a, um, it's a free adjunct or add-on to um, as part of the Yang tools, as part of the deluxe open daylight distribution. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, and I guess we've, you know, with, again, within that distribution, you know, we've, packaged, we've got a bunch of apps we're showing here today. And some of them are around you know, real sort of carrier apps for you know, how do you optimize use of your backbone or how do you deploy new services. That's for an example of an app that's really focused around how do we make developers more productive and make it easier for them. Um, I was going to talk about developer productivity. So here's an example. So I'm a horrible programmer. Um, so I, I had this, this app that we wrote two weeks ago. And I was thinking this morning, well, what can I do to show the REST API? Because I've got, I've got something that shows the Java, but how do I show the REST APIs and how you write code for them? So I wrote some Python code this morning. Um, I can show you the code. So it's literally one, one page of Python source, or two pages if I zoom in on it. Um, and a lot of you know, the top's just basically templating and includes. And this is the template for that same API I used earlier to add an LSP. So we create that as a template. And I'm just going to add dynamic LSPs here. And what this app does is it simply meshes all the nodes in the network. So if you're going to mesh all the nodes, the first thing you need to do is get the list of nodes. So this is where I get the list of nodes. And you can see I'm literally saying, well, I'm, I'm looking in the topology under node. I'm finding the bit that says unicast topology and the router ID. And then that gives me the router name. So I'll loop through that to get them all. And having done that, I'll then sort the list, because it's kind of nice to see it happen in order. And then I'll literally go through that list, have an inner loop where I'm going through the list again. If it's the same box, well, obviously, you don't want an LSP from yourself to yourself, because that's a bit pointless. So as long as it's not, we create the tunnel. And we use the templates I created above 
I put in the source and destination IPs, and then I call the API. I never, ever do demos when you're speaking live. It's just, just asking for trouble. But we'll see what happens. And again, you'll see it run reasonably slowly because it's having to log on to each router. Once it logs on to it, it's got to create a tunnel interface, do the commit, and come back. So you can see the first one's now being created. And it's literally just going to cycle through creating those. And at the end of it, what you'll have is a full mesh of tunnels. So each node will have tunnels to all the other nodes. In fact, yeah, if we go to that first router, in fact, yeah, let's do it this way. So, okay. So that's the one I created earlier. But you can now see one that's just been created now. Um, and there should only be. Yeah, so it's only got a dynamic path, and it's going to the next router, dot two. You'll find the next one will be going to dot three. And again, only a dynamic path, and so on. And that'll be the last one. So effectively, at that point, you can see it's almost finished now. It's got one more to go. And so that was literally. Let's say for somebody who's not really a great Python coder, and I, you know, I've only been playing with Python for sort of six or eight months, um, and it took me you know, a couple of hours to write that. And most of that was me being stupid and not realizing that something I thought was a, an individual entry was actually a list that just had one item in the list, and I was getting funny errors, and eventually figured that out. Um, I'd say very, you know, really very little code to achieve that. And I guess you then have to contrast that to what you might have done in, in previous times with CLI, where you'd have to be writing expect scripts that would log into the router, figure out you know, how do I create an interface. You've got to deal with all the, the potential issues of knowing the exact CLI on each router. And the CLI, of course, might subtly change between iOS releases as we add more features. Whereas through the Yang models, you, avo you avoid that issue. And certainly coding, you know, coding something where you're just hitting HTTP is a lot easier than writing expect scripts that are having to pretend to be a human. And certainly, you know, as Chris said, we've got eight or nine apps that we're showing on the Dev Innovate stand. And if, if you want to come over and see any of those apps, by all means do. If you want to sort of see this stuff and actually understand how the Python works and the, and the rest of the interfaces, again, we can go through all of that. Um, I mean, I'm incredibly early here on the finish. But really, any questions you have, anything else you want to see, then. You know, we're here all week. I think Chris and I are here until the bitter end on Friday. So certainly we can show you all these different demos, including this one. And yeah, just, um, you know, I guess my message in the end, uh, in ultimately, is if you want to get into this world of developing apps on top of controllers, then, you know, really the first thing is to get proficient in something like Python. The Java stuff, as I say, if you want to do high performance apps, go that way, but probably not unless you're already a Java programmer. The tricky thing often is that. You know, what I've found historically working in carriers is that the, you know, the guys who write Java code and the guys who run the network are pretty different groups. So I think one of the challenges is how do we start putting those groups together. But I think learning Python shouldn't be too big an ask. So I see Benoit sitting over there, um, who's one of the, the ITF uh, area directors in the ops area. And he actually wrote a blog recently on you know, why he decided to learn Python. And really around this, it's just a really useful skill to have if you're writing these apps. And the other thing, as I said, as I said also, is just if you want to write on the Cisco Open SCN controller, it's, you've really got to get to grips with the Yang models. And that's, the, that's probably the hardest learning curve. Um, but within you know, not too long, you can, you can get your head around that. Yeah, I was just going to add, uh, uh, Giles, that uh, the Chrome browser, for example, has some developer tools. And as you execute some of these programs, uh, you can look at the REST API calls and the JSON or XML content that's in there. So that's another way that I learned to understand exactly what was happening between the application and the platform, a la the REST Conf API calls. Yeah, and we're very happy to share code. I mean, I guess all this has been done in this open source spirit. So if you want to see any of my example code, I can you know, very happily throw that over the fence. 
and that's probably good. You know, it's the classic thing, isn't it? I don't know if you've, has anyone ever written a Python pr program from scratch? I mean, somebody must have done once when they wrote the language, because there must have been like the, the day zero Python program. But you just never do. You always take something that someone else has done, that, or you've done, that's as close as possible to what you want, and then you hack it around and say it is what you want. So yeah, we're very happy to give you those starting points that you can work from. So any, any other questions or, or comments? Well, with that, I guess I'll wrap up. And as I say, I've probably given you 20 minutes of your lives back. But do, I mean, please do come over and see us on the stand. And you know, if you want to really get in depth with it, we can certainly arrange that. We're running demos all the time, and there'll always be someone there. Ah. Um, under body, you have a template uh, uh -huh. where you have source and destination yes. uh, for the router IDs. Um, what is in a template? Can you show us? Ah, so the template is, is basically the text that we're going to put okay. into the API. Okay. Okay. But to make it easier, rather than creating it from yeah. scratch each yeah. time. So the bandwidth and yeah. a as a template, okay. and it's got two variables in yeah. it. Because I was wondering from uh, where you got the bandwidth and everything. So, OK, now. Yeah, and you can see, in fact, here, I'm literally saying take that template and substitute the variables. Again, I stole that from someone else. I didn't think of it. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks. And um, yeah, they'll sorry I need to gavel. Um, I'm going once, then <laughs> twice. Yeah. Um, just wondering, is there a, a learning lab or something like that where I can go and uh, where I can go and play around with this? I believe we're putting that together. So, um, Chris, I think Ken's doing that, putting learning labs together for this. Are they actually got them up and running? Cool. So definitely, yeah, go over it. Yeah, yeah, check it out. I mean, there's some learning labs over there, and you can take a look at some of these platforms, including the, um, the Cisco distribution of Open Daylight, you know, the, the Open SDN controller. And of course, the great thing is, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's so easy to just download it and get playing with it. Um, you can, as, as I mentioned, we have the EFT running of the Cisco controller. So talk to an actually if you want to be involved in that. In terms of Open Daylight, you just go to opendaylight.org and download it. Hey, I was just going to add that um, sometimes you need a network to see these things work. So <laughs> mini net yes. works fine for uh, open flow based networks, but you know we got viral, and you can set up a you know a, a few XR VR routers and uh, connect them to your instance of Open Daylight or Cisco Open SDN controller, and and start to really play around with the this stuff. Yeah, and the va the vast majority of what I've done has just been with with virtual XR instances. Um, and I, I don't tend to use viral because I'm pretty too much of a control freak and I run the individual ones myself. But it's all there. And even, um, you know, we have releases of XR now that have NetConf Yang in them. Uh, of course, with XR, you get access to BGPLS and PSAP, which again lets you get those plugins. That doesn't give you OpenFlow because it's a, a virtual box. So it doesn't have the forwarding plane the 9K has. But as Chris mentioned, there's, if you want to do OpenFlow, then probably MiniNet's the easiest way to go. And again, I think there's a tutorial on the Open Daylight site on how to get Mininet up and running with Open Daylight. So you can just follow through that tutorial. We've actually built a tutorial um, on going through the Cisco Open SDN controller. And there's this, um, I didn't actually drill into it, but I mentioned um, one of the APIs here. This is an example of doing an RPC from, from REST. And you'll see this coffee maker make coffee. Uh, that's something that's basically a a set of stuff you can go through, kind of a learning lab. And that's where you end up with is with a virtual coffee machine and making coffee with an RPC. So yeah, worth going through that, I think. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. And yeah, come talk to us. Oh, hang on, one more. <laughs> this is great. This is... I, kind of, I kind of prefer conversations to presentations. I'm liking this. So uh, BGPLS, you need just first time when you upload the topology state? Or you need all the time to upload any changes in a topology? It will upload them as they occur. So BGPLS, what it, the problem it was designed to solve was if you have something like an SDN controller and you want visibility of OSPF or ISIS or of your link state IGP, I guess the challenge is you don't want to put your controller in the IGP for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it makes people incredibly nervous. The second one is your controller might not be adjacent to that network that you, you want visibility of. So what BGPLS does is it takes that data and it then exports it out over BGP 
And then as it changes, those changes will get sent. And it, um, it's not just the link state data, it's also all of the traffic engineering data in the case of ISST or, or OSPFTE. And in terms of config, so any um, newish release of XR supports it. Um, but actually, NetConfiang uh, uh, is able to populate those. Sorry, the? NetConfiang is also collecting those information, so. Yes, why? but we, um, with NetConfiang, the main thing it gives you access to is config, but it also lets you get at operational data. So in fact, you can get at rib data, which is very much the same stuff. Um, some of those things, again, I think aren't actually there in, um, in XRVR because they're trying to get at real hardware. And because XRVR is on, on Intel and not on real ASICs, you can't get at all the operational state. But uh, yeah, I was going to quickly show you the, so for BGPLS as a, an example. Yeah. There's only a couple of things you need to do. So in, we're running OSPF here. You can see we're running traffic engineering. And the key thing is there's a command, distribute BGPLS, which just says, take, take my information and pass it through to BGPLS. And then if I go to my, uh, and you can see here I have, I've set up that I have this link state address family. I've also got a uh, normal V4 routing, et cetera. And this is my neighbor for open daylight. Or in fact, Cisco OSC in this case. Um, and that neighbor basically says, well, I'm going to run IPv4 unicast, and I'm going to run link state. And that will result in that data getting there. And what you then have on top of that is PSEP. PSEP is an API that lets, or it's a protocol, and we have an API for it in open daylight that lets you create tunnels. And Chris, again, we've got a PSEP demo as one of the demos on the stand. But the app I showed, what we were doing was saying, well, what if you've got a network that you haven't yet upgraded to the very latest and greatest release and you don't have PSEP support? And I think Dave Ward mentioned this this morning um, in the session he had with Kelly, where he was saying, you know, you, it's just not reality in a service provider that when, when Cisco ships, you know, XR 5.3, that you have it across your whole network tomorrow. You know, that's, that's just never going to happen. It takes a long time to qualify things and roll them out. So one of our customers said to us, well, how do we do this stuff now with the release we have? And that's why we wrote that app to provide an API that was the same as the PSET one on Open Daylight. But that API in this instance was actually configuring stuff through CLI that was compatible with, with the release of XR they were already running. So that's a kind of example of the things you can do with, as I mentioned, I guess, at the beginning, it, don't think of, of, of the controller as just a controller. Think of it as a development environment. And so when someone came to us and said, that's what we need, it was a question of, well, I get a developer, I explain what I need, we, we build the Yang model together, so we, together we figured out this is what the model's going to look like, and then I just left him coding it for five or six days, and the result was that application. Um, but as I say, if you've got the new releases, then great, you know, go ahead with PSAP. Well, so I don't have the, uh, the auctioneers thing of going, going, gone, but if there's no more questions, then, yeah, just, just come and grab me or Chris or any of the other guys anytime this week, and we're very happy to show you stuff. So thanks again. <laughs>